Uh, th this time I'll be talking about adversarial methods. And I think this is a good thing to round off the end of the class because it's something that's a little bit more complex and you definitely won't use it in every one of your projects, but it's something that you probably will want to use at some point uh, because they're very useful in a number of uh, capacities. So I will, uh, I, I want to make sure that I cover them so everybody can, can know about them. So basically the idea behind adversarial methods is that um, we, we have methods that have a model and the model that we want to learn and an adversary that works in tandem to help the underlying model learn. So we basically have two models or at least two model components. And there's a number of different kind of instantiations of this that do different things that use the adversary in a different way. So perhaps the most famous one is generative adversarial networks or GANs. And in this particular case, uh, the model generates an output. So in NLP or text generation, this might be something like text. And the adversary attempts to detect generated text. However, there's also other methods. So adversarial feature learning, uh, the model generates features and the adversary tries to distinguish features of different types. And then there's also, adversarial robustness. And in adversarial robustness, this is where the adversary tries to perturb the input to cause the model to fail. And in addition, the model may be trained. It, it's not necessarily trained, but it may be trained to be robust to these perturbations. So all of these things are similar in that they have a model in an adversary. However, the details of them are pretty different, especially the details of adversarial robustness uh, versus generative adversarial networks or adversarial feature learning. So I'll take each of these in turn. And the first thing I want to talk about is generative adversarial networks. And we talked about generative models uh, several times during this class, most recently uh, last lecture. And Basically, generative models uh, try to model a data distribution P of X or a conditional uh, data distribution P of X given Y or P of Y given X, uh, whichever way you want to talk about it. And latent variable models, uh, like the ones we talked about before, introduce further a latent variable Z, where we calculate the marginal probability over the latent variables uh, Z. So there's a number of things that we would like a generative model to be able to do. And uh, one thing is evaluate likelihood and also be very good at maximizing the likelihood of the uh, you know, training data that we have or the, the development data. So one example of this would be uh, measured by perplexity in language modeling. So we're very familiar with this at this point. Another thing is generating samples. So we could generate a sentence randomly from P of X or a condition of some information using P of uh, X given Y, uh, text generation or uh, unconditional text generation or conditional text generation, for example. Or we could use it to infer latent attributes. So for example, we talked about topic models, we talked about VAEs. We might want the model to be able to infer these latent variable Z that somehow induce a variety, some variety of structure on top of the input data that we have, uh, probably in an unsupervised manner. So no generative model is perfect. And um, we're going to be talking about generative adversarial networks here. Um, but we've also talked about non-latent generative models. So these are models without latent variables, like regular language models that we've talked about. We also have VAEs, which we talked about last lecture, and we have GANs, which we're going to be talking about this lecture. Um, non-latent and VAE-style generative models 
mostly rely on maximizing the likelihood uh, or the lower bound of the likelihood, the elbow, like I talked about last time. Whereas GANs are essentially trained using a different objective. They're not trained to actually maximize the likelihood of the uh, data. So in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of each, uh, in terms of evaluating likelihood, in general, non-latent models uh, do the best at this. DAEs are also okay at this, but the problem is they're not directly optimizing the likelihood. They are rather optimizing the, uh, the elbow of the likelihood. So they might not get the best likelihood. And also they're a little bit more com complex. So if you just want to evaluate the likelihood, usually a non-latent model is, is sufficient. GANs essentially have trouble evaluating the likelihood um, because they're not trained as a likelihood-based model, but um, there are ways you can kind of horseshoe them into, uh, into evaluating likelihood if you really want to. In terms of generation, um, for images, for example, non-latent uh, variable models um, tend to do worse. Uh, sorry, non-latent variable models in VAEs tend to do worse than GANs, and I'm going to talk about this in the next slide. And for inference, um, we were talking about inferring latent variables. So uh, VAEs kind of excel at this. They are the best tool that we have right now for inferring latent variables like the ones we talked about last class, uh, but GANs can also um, generate latent variables and you can infer them as well. So if we look at MLE versus GANs, this is a, a very old image from 2015 and a lot of progress has been made on both MLE and GANs from now, but I think this is a good, in general, this is a good illustration of kind of the strengths and weaknesses of both. So an MLE-based model um, that is trained to generate images can do something like, uh, essentially, uh, it will generate an image, but the image will be fuzzy or um, kind of blurred together. Whereas the generative adversarial network generates a much sharper image uh, like this. And the reason for this can be relatively obvious. So why would an MLE-based model want to generate a fuzzy image? Um, and the answer is basically an MLE-based model will pay a penalty when it gives a really low probability to anything plausible. So the MLE-based model is trained to maximize the probability of all the data it's seen. So if it says any particular image gets a very low probability, that's a bad thing for the MLE-based model. However, on the other hand, what that means is it won't commit very strongly to any individual feature. It won't commit very strongly to saying, yes, we definitely need an edge here, or we definitely need this ear to be very sharp. Because if it did that, then it might rule out other plausible interpretations, other plausible images. And uh, because of that, it would pay a big penalty in likelihood. This can also translate into, for example, um, text generation models in that an MLE-based text generation model may overweight frequent words. It may give too high of a probability to uh, words with high frequency. And because of this, if you tried to generate, for example, from the highest scoring, like let's say we're doing machine translation, for example, a conditional text generation task, the uh, maximum likelihood trained model will generate a word distribution that overemphasizes frequent words. It will generate more frequent words than actual natural looking text. So um, a similar problem exists in, uh, in text generation as well, just being you know, overly cautious, overly weighting kind of high, uh, highly you know, frequent phenomena or things like this. Um, is this clear? Okay. Um, 
So now regarding the basic paradigm of uh, training generative adversarial networks, basically we have two models. Uh, one model is a generator and another model is a discriminator. And the discriminator, what it does is it's basically a classifier that says given an image, try to tell whether it is real or not. So basically it's calculating the probability that the image is real um, or you know, anything, any generated thing. For the generator, it's trying to generate an image or text that fools the discriminator into answering real. And the desired result after you're done training the model is that the generator is perfect. So the generator generates a perfect image that is indistinguishable from, um, from real images. And the discriminator cannot tell the difference. So basically, at the end of training, you want the generator to succeed and the discriminator to fail. For, uh, with respect to the training method, basically what you do is you sample a mini batch of training data from the, uh, from the actual training data. You also uh, sample latent variables. So these could just be you know, Gaussian noise like we've talked about before. And then based on these uh, latent variables, we convert them with the generator into uh, fake uh, outputs, be it you know, images or text or whatever. And then we predict with the discriminator, and this is, uh, these are the labels predicted by the discriminator. And we have a discriminator loss where it's a higher loss if we fail our predictions. And then we have our, our generator loss, which is higher if we have correct predictions, but we calculate this only over the fake data. So basically the idea being, for the discriminator, we're training it on both the real data and the fake data to try to accurately predict. And for the generator loss, we're training it only on the fake data to try to get it, um, to try to make, uh, reduce the discriminator loss here. And so that, that's what the gradient cap looks like basically. So if we look at this in equations, um, this is what the loss function looks like. So basically, we, uh, we sample a bunch of uh, real data and we want to predict real for real data with the discriminator and predict fake for fake data. So this is the discriminator loss function. And then for the generator loss function, there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, one way is that we can just make the generated data like less fake. So we take the opposite of the discriminator loss and we set this as the generator loss. So this kind of makes sense. Uh, it makes it a zero sum game between the discriminator and the generators. So if the uh, you know, discriminator is bad, the generator is good and vice versa. However, um, one issue with this is if the generator loss or sorry, if the discriminator loss starts out being very, let's see, if the, if the discriminator loss starts out being zero, um, in other words, the discriminator is really, really good, then that also means that this loss will be zero. So basically both of them will have, uh, will have a zero loss, a loss very close to zero. And um, that's an issue if, it's an issue if you have essentially a loss function that has very very low gradient uh, when your loss is close to zero like for example sigmoid loss function it's kind of hard to see that. Um, I'm all out of working markers today, uh, unfortunately. But basically, if you think about what a sigmoid loss function looks like, it's kind of like it goes up like this. And if your loss is zero, you have very little gradient for that loss function. 
And so if you have very little gradient for the discriminator, you'll also have very little gradient for the discriminator, uh, for the generator. So because of that, basically it makes it harder to learn. Um, so an alternative is to make the um, generated data more real, which is basically you use the log uh, probability of the discriminator. And the log probability of the discriminator when this is very close to zero uh, becomes very, uh, or the negative log probability of the discriminator when the discriminator probability is very close to zero becomes a very large number. So this ensures that you don't encounter this problem here. So this is a more common uh, way of implementing this. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this? Okay, cool. So um, one really important, one really important way to think about generative adversarial networks and um, also uh, adversarial feature learning is that this is about distribution matching. And what do I mean by this? I basically mean we, um, we have a sample of this uh, you know, latent variable here. We run it through some sort of transformation and uh, run it through a, dis a deterministic function. And as a result, we have a implicit distribution over P of X uh, that is parameterized uh, that is basically this P of Z and then a uh, parameterized transform here. And this process can produce any complicated distribution P of X with a reasonable P of Z and a powerful enough uh, F. So this sounds really familiar, right? If you were paying attention uh, last Thursday. So this is very, very similar to what we were trying to do with, um, with variational autoencoders. The difference is variational autoencoders, we were actually maximizing the likelihood of the generated outputs. Whereas here, the only thing we're trying to do is we are trying to ensure that the distribution generated by this uh, f, of, f of z here is so close to the actual natural data distribution that another strong neural network is not able to distinguish between the two. So it's two different ways of approaching the same problem of distribution matching. One, VAE is doing a likelihood-based training approach. Here, we're doing a training approach based on generating a distribution where we aren't able to easily you know, distinguish between that and the true distribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the elbow, th that's, um, that's a very interesting question. So the elbow had two parts. Um, the first one was the likelihood part, and then the second one was the KL divergence. So in GANs, essentially, I don't, I don't want to like get this completely wrong, so I'll hedge a little bit. But I think basically in, um, the reason why we needed to have the KL divergence term over the prior was because we had an inference network that was trying to um, that was trying to predict the underlying distribution there. And in order to make everything kind of mathematically not equivalent, but in order to ensure that the uh, elbow is actually a lower bound of the likelihood, we needed to add that term just by looking at the equations, by, by running the equations through. Here, there is no likelihood term. So really it's not actually equivalent in any way. However, there is a slight equivalence, which is that you're trying to match the similarity of the two distributions, but here you're trying to do it over um, you're trying to match the two distributions here. You're trying to do it over P of X. Uh, there you were trying to do it over P of Z with the KL divergence term. Um, but I think that's basically where the similarity finishes. 
Um, one other interesting thing is um, in VAEs, remember we have a KL divergence term measuring the similarity of the inferred distribution and the prior probability. Uh, there, we don't need to use any GAN or anything like that because we can analytically solve the similarity between the prior Gaussian and the inferred Gaussian just because Gaussians are a very simple distribution. Um, we can't do that here, obviously. Um, however, there is a version of the VAE that does that. There's a version of the VAE that basically tries to distinguish between um, samples from the prior probability and samples from the, uh, the inference network distribution. Um, I, I'm trying to remember what that, the name of that was. I actually answered this question on Thursday too, but I think it's called like the Wasserstein VAE or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah. Cool. Okay, so um, in pseudocode, uh, this is really, it's quite simple, theoretically anyway. It's simple in theory, uh, slightly less simple in practice. But basically, in pseudocode, we have X real sampled from the training data. Uh, we sample uh, our, uh, you know, vector from the normal distribution or the uniform distribution or anything else, really. Um, we generate, uh, based on this, uh, Based on the generator, we discriminate uh, both of those uh, sets and we calculate uh, the log like this. And this is the heuristic non saturated loss here. Oh, yeah, that, that's a heuristic non saturated. So, why are GANs good? I've already kind of mentioned this, but basically, the discriminator is a learned um, metric parameterized by powerful neural networks. So no matter how complicated the two distributions that we're trying to measure the similarity between are, nonetheless, we know that a, um, a neural network should be able to uh, distinguish the differences between them if trained appropriately. And it can easily pick up on any kind of discrepancy, uh, for example, blurriness or global inconsistency. Um, so just to give an example, uh, one of the common problems with MLE uh, trained text generators is MLE trained text generators tend to repeat the same words over and over again if you generate from them. Uh, if it did that and you were using a GAN to train a text generation system, it would immediately be penalized really badly because the generator could very easily pick up on that pattern. Like, okay, you have lots of repeated words in the sentence. Uh, that's probably an issue. That's probably not a not a good thing. Um, and another thing is, uh, I mentioned before that MLE trained models might overemphasize frequent words. That also could be penalized by again because again could say, oh, there's lots of frequent words in the sentence. It's less likely to be a real sentence and more likely to be a generated sentence. So these are just a couple intuitive examples. It could pick up on anything. Uh, you know, theoretically. Um, I see a question on Zoom regarding the model that uses techniques from both VAE and GAN. Is it the adversarial autoencoder? Um, I, I don't think that was the name of the one that I was thinking about, but I'll, I'll try to look it up uh, after class if I remember. So. Um, okay, so the second, uh, the second question thing is the generator has fine-grained gradient signals to inform it uh, about what and how to improve. This is particularly the case for end-to-end -end differentiable functions. Um, so if we talk about image generation, for example, um, let's say we were generating this image that I showed before. Um, Let's say the GAN particularly picked up on the fact that this person doesn't have an ear um, is an example that this might be a wrong, uh, you know, a poorly generated image. If that was the case, there would be more gradient flowing into the ear. And because there would be more gradient flowing into the ear, the generator could focus on, you know, improving its learning of uh, its ear generation. And, you know, it would generate more and more realistic ears until the, you know, GAN, uh, until the discriminator couldn't tell the difference between them and the aliens. 
So that's another uh, really good advantage of uh, models like this. However, um, it, it's not actually so simple. So uh, there are problems in uh, GAN training. And the main problem uh, is while GANs are really great in theory, training them is notoriously difficult. So there's a number of known problems and solutions to them. Uh, the first one is convergence and stability. And these issues of convergence and stability mainly stem from the fact that you're training two models at once. And so you basically have a non-stationary distribution for either of them. Like you train the generator, but then the discriminator changes. You train the uh, discriminator and the generator changes. And um, this can cause you to, um, uh, you know, basically converge incorrectly. So the Wasserstein GAN, which I talked about is, is one example. Um, a bigger problem is uh, mode collapse. And basically what mode collapse is, is if you have a generator, one way to make it very difficult to distinguish between the generated outputs and the actual outputs is just to copy a single output, uh, a single thing from the data set into the output. So you just copy a single image and, um, and uh, generate it every single time. And because it's a real image, at least some of the time the discriminator will fail, right? It will, just, it will fail when it gets that image as the real image. Um, however, this is obviously a problem because you'll get very boring generations of the same face every time or the same text every time. So um, one way to fix this is using something called mini batch discrimination, which is where you feed in a whole mini batch of outputs and try to dis distinguish whether this whole mini batch is correct or not. So if you see the whole mini batch is full of all of the same uh, outputs, then that's a pretty good clue that, you know, this is the mode collapse scan instead of the real data distribution. Um, and there's other examples like this. Um, the overconfident discriminator um, is basically uh, right at the beginning of training. The discrimination is much easier than um, than generation because it's kind of like the KL divergence that I talked about before. Um, in the VAE, it's, there's a very trivial solution to solving the KL divergence at the very beginning of VAE training, which is to always predict the prior. Um, at the very beginning of GAN training, it's very easy to discriminate because all of the generated things are going to be very bad, right? And they're usually going to contain just noise and, and not be uh, easy to uh, discriminate, so, uh, or going to be too easy to discriminate. So. Um, one way to fix this is to use one-sided label smoothing, which is basically, um, I talked about label smoothing before, I believe, which is um, where you allocate some of the probability of the true label to other false labels. And here you allocate some of the probability to prevent the GAN from being very confident in its decisions of uh, fake. So um, these are all some tricks. and. Uh, I believe in the um, in the reading material, there's a GAN tutorial that talks about all of these tricks in a little bit more detail. Cool. Um, any any questions here? Yeah. Uh, I have a question Yeah, that, that's what mode collapse uh, means. Yeah. Right. So, so this is the theory that. Yeah, yeah, you feed in, um, you feed in the whole mini batch into the discriminator. It'd be really nice to, uh, to have markers, but you feed. Yeah, exactly. So then. Like let's say your mini batch size is four, you get four of the same face fed into the discriminator, and the, the discriminator says this is obviously fake because yeah, and, and 
normally you generate the whole mini batch in parallel anyway. So, um, so you feed in like four different random, random seeds you generate, and then the discriminator has the ability to notice that all four at the same time. Well, so for example, um, yeah, so normally that's what they do. Um, okay, great. So now um, all of this is kind of just general stuff about GANs that could be applied to any, um, you know, any variety of data. Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about um, applying them directly to text. And there's a number of examples of this, like GANs have been used for language generation, uh, conditional language generation, like machine translation, uh, dialogue generation, and other things like this. So um, the main issue that occurs here is the same issue that we talked about uh, with BAEs or other you know, structured training methods. And the, uh, the problem here is that X fake is, um, is discrete. So it's not easy to backprop through this to the generator. And essentially the solution here is that this is a very good test case for all of the methods that we've talked about in the past couple of classes for structured learning of models uh, with latent variables. So um, we can have uh, policy gradient style reinforcement learning methods. Uh, we can also use a uh, reparameterization trick for latent variables using the Gumbel softmax. So that's also, uh, you know, something that I talked about last time. Um, so this is basically just a rehash of what we talked about before. So I'm, I'm not going to go into that more detail. The next thing is that we need a discriminator to try to tell if a sequence is uh, real or not. Um, and in GAN work, it was common to use uh, CNNs for discriminators on sentences or pairs of sentences. Um, and so basically this is uh, an example of a discriminator for pairs of sentences where basically um, what it does is it extracts local feature windows and it combines them uh, together. Uh, and does uh, convolution and pooling and more convolution and pooling and finally makes a prediction. Um, I think that you could certainly use BERT or something like that as well, but there's a caveat with using a discriminator, um, which is uh, this here and basically the, uh, the issue that they found in this paper is actually if your discriminator was too good, um, that also caused uh, issues with training. Um, so they found the CNN uh, style discriminator that they had to be kind of a sweet spot that allowed them to uh, train the model well. Whereas if you, um, if you had a discriminator that was like too strong, um, it would also cause issues. So they had to directly tune the, um, the strength of the discriminator. So the discriminator was appropriately strong, not too weak, um, and also not too strong uh, in order to maintain the uh, level of accuracy. And this is a blue score in a machine translation class. And the reason why is what I talked about uh, before, you know, if you have an overconfident discriminator at the beginning of training, the discriminator, you know, basically is, um, is too good and uh, the gradients that are flowing into your, um, into your training are, are not, uh, not useful or they're too flat and uh, this just results in noise. Um, the uh, one thing I, I didn't mention, um, like explicitly, but maybe I should uh, mention more uh, more explicitly is this discrete bottleneck is always a problem when you're trying to train a model using reinforcement learning or anything else. Um, however, it's 
a problem on top of GANs being difficult to train already. So it's basically like, um, it's already hard to train, for example, a machine translation system to optimize blue score, where blue score is something that's static, it's not a moving target. So then on top of that, now you're also optimizing towards a moving target discriminator. And uh, it, it makes an already hard problem even harder, which is why um, even with the very smart people who ran lots of experiments and, and tried to tune all the hyperreferent as well, it's still hard to get this to work. So I think this is part of the reason why GANs have not been super extensively uh, used in text generation. That being said, I do think they're a really good tool and they're one you, you could consider, especially now that we have you know powerful models, better initialization and, uh, and other things like that. Um, another example, uh, this is the learning rate for the generator. So they tuned the learning rate for the generator and the discriminator. Um, learning rate for the discriminator. So all of these uh, require uh, hyperparameter tuning as well. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if I remember correctly, this was, they pre-trained the model with maximum likelihood, which is also why the blue, the blue score here starts at 33 instead of like zero. So they pre-trained the model using a maximum likelihood model. And I think they trained the discriminator for a little while, like for as long as it took in order to get to that level of accuracy on the MLE generated outputs. So um, basically they pre-trained the generator mostly to convergence and pre-trained the discriminator until they got to this point and then they started the GAN training. Um, for things like grammatical agreement, that would not be enough, I believe, unless this pooling operation could pick that up. Um, if the pooling operation could pick that up, which I think is likely. Um, yeah, I, I think that it probably could pick that up, but it would be more direct to pick it up through like self-attention or something. Another thing is these papers, like uh, adversarial networks were extremely popular in 2017. So most of the you know, papers uh, where if you just put adversarial in the title, your paper would be accepted uh, <laughs> was, it was you know, four years ago. And that was like also literally the same time that Bert and other things were coming out. So I think you know, revisiting some of these ideas with newer infrastructures and stuff like that would also be something interesting in the uh, you know, underlying ideas might change or the underlying empirical results might change too. Um, that being said, this is for GANs and the two things that I'm gonna talk about later, adversarial feature learning and adversarial training are still very standard nowadays. So uh, there's three varieties. Um, so here's a question, um, the takeaway, the takeaway is not to use a very strong discriminator and uh, like a BERT one. And how common is it to not train your classifier and use it only to guide generator training? Um, oh, two very good questions. Um, the question about not using a very strong discriminator, I think basically you want the discriminator to be of a similar level of strength as the model that you're trying to use to do generation. So if you were generating using GPD-3 or something like that, that generates very convincing looking text, I think you'd want your discriminator to be as, as strong as possible right out the gate because it's hard even for humans uh, to discriminate them. So there, you know, you'd want the two models to be of similar strength, I think. And um, how common is it to not train the classifier and use it only to guide generator training? That's an interesting question. I haven't seen something like that um, with respect to GANs, although you, yeah, I, I haven't seen something like that with respect to GANs. It might be, um, you might see something like that with respect to fairness or, or um, other things like that where you're trying to, um, distinguish between 
or you're or you're trying to prevent a model from generating toxic content, for example. So you have a toxic content classifier, and that's pre-trained, and you want to train the model not to generate things according to that. So, um, I have another question. Um, since we know some text perturbations can attack a model to always generate an output, has it been seen that a generator just becomes an attacker? Um, that's a good question. Maybe I'll answer that after um, after we talk about adversarial perturbations, which is uh, in the latter part of this. Cool. Um, so one stabilization trick that people have used is that getting a reward at the end of a sentence gives a credit assignment problem. So this is uh, like the reward shaping problem that we talked about in reinforcement learning. And the solution is we can assign a reward for partial sentences, for partial sequences. So this is an example. First, you run the discriminator over this. This is, this is, this is a fake. And then the moment you hit fake, you know, or some other indication that the sentence is fake, not real, then this is where you, um, uh, this is where you start essentially uh, modifying the generator uh, or feeding gradients into the generator. So um, the moment the discriminator probability falls is, um, is the place where you start backpropping into the um, uh, into the generator, and this is there's a number of different ways to do this. Most of them are kind of heuristic, which is basically like um, you assign the um, the difference in the classification probability as uh, as the loss for each word. So the difference between like the classification here and the classification here would become the loss for the word fake. So um, there are uh, examples like this. Another example, this is just standard from uh, reinforcement learning as well. You do multiple rollouts. So for each sentence, um, you roll out different, uh, you roll out different generations, and then you have a discriminator over all of the different generations. This is using, um, uh, this is a little bit more complicated than the standard way of doing things, but you can just use the standard way of uh, doing, uh, like generating using multiple random seeds and scoring all. So another uh, really big issue that we have is that um, we can't backprop through discrete choices. So a very simple and in my mind, relatively elegant way to fix this is basically to discriminate over softmax results instead. So um, the idea is normally we would do the adversary over the actual generated output. Um, but here, instead, we do the adversary over the probabilities of the, the generated output. And you know, if we are doing greedy search, actually the generated output is deterministically, you can find the generated output deterministically from these probabilities. Um, so this kind of gives you strictly more information and you can backprop all the way into the model without doing any sort of uh, like, doing any sort of, uh, you know, tricks like reinforce or, or gumball stuff. Okay. So um, the next thing that I would like to talk about is adversarial feature learning. This is really, really useful. Um, and you can use it in a number of different settings. So for example, um, in generative adversarial networks, we are doing the adversary over the output here. In adversarial feature learning, we're doing the adversary over the hidden features that we induce. Um, so why would you want to do this? Um, we can think of uh, using this in non-generative tasks. So uh, just like classification tasks, for example. And we can also, it's also uh, continuous features are easier than discrete outputs, like I just mentioned. So the most famous version of this is, I've actually already talked about this in the domain adaptation um, 
uh, lecture, but just for completeness, it's learning domain invariant representations. So um, we might want to learn features that cannot be distinguished by domain. So let's say we have a text classifier, we extract features, um, and then the features that we extract go both into the quote unquote generator, but in this case, it's a classifier, and into a domain classifier. So uh, the, I, the idea here basically is that we would like these features to allow us to determine the class label, but not determine uh, the domain label. So um, this can also be applied to things like um, data augmentation. So if you have a data augmentation method to create artificial data for training your model, you can learn features that do not have the ability to tell, like it's not possible to tell whether the data was synthetically created or not, but are able to solve the downstream tasks. So this is a way to kind of make the synthetically generated data, uh, like make it work for you uh, maximally. Um, there was another thing I wanted to mention here. Uh, what was it? So, <laughs> sorry, I forgot the uh, the other thing I was going to mention before I, I started talking about synthetic data, but I'll, I'll try to get back to it if I if I remember. So, um, yeah, this is uh, this is very nice because basically. Um, Oh yes, I remember. So basically, um, this makes no presuppositions about you know the what the shape of the feature should be for a particular domain, other than the fact that it should be similar across domains. However, there is one there is one um, situation under which this is definitely not a good idea. Um, so like, let's say, let's say we think about something like, I'm trying to think of an example. Okay, let, let's say we think about reviews of, used cars, used cars, and new cars, and try to run a feature extractor like this um, to measure the, um, to measure, uh, to kind of like match the domain of used cars and new cars. Can anyone think of a problem with this? So you, used cars, you buy from a, a used car dealership, uh, maybe from a shady person who is uh, selling them to you, a new car you buy from a more reputable de dealership. Um, so why would matching the features between these two distributions maybe be a bad idea? kind of a tricky question. Yeah. So you might be thinking about different things when you're buying a used car. Uh, maybe that is true, but actually you could argue that that might be a good uh, feature of this also because it would put both of the things that you think about as when buying a used car and the things you think about when buying a new car into the same feature space. Um, as a hint, do you, think, do you think used cars would be getting similar reviews to new cars? No, I see people timidly shaking your head. You don't want to commit because this is a hard problem, but yeah. So basically the distribution over reviews would be different. Does that seem like it would be a problem? Review scores. So basically, 
I'll, I'll, I'll give a, uh, I'll give a hint. So or I'll, I'll give the answer. So basically like if we have our features H and we generate our features H really up here. Um, we generate our features H from the input. Oh, wow. Okay. There we go. We generate our features H from the input. And then based on H, we predict Y. If the distribution over Y is different between the two domains, but we force the distribution over H to be the same between the two domains, then we're never going to be able to, um, we're never going to be able to achieve perfect accuracy S because um, if the distribution over H is the same, then we're never gonna be able to learn things like, oh, but new cars should get higher ratings on average than uh, used cars. So, um, so basically, in the case of label shift, which I talked about, um, I think I talked about during the uh, domain adaptation lecture, where the um, where the distribution over y changes between the two domains, then you're going to have issues here, essentially. Um, so the only time when you can still achieve perfect accuracy with uh, a like with a situation like this is uh, when the probability, the marginal probability over the labels is the same across the labels. Another, um, so to give another example of where we can use um, representations, um, we can also do this over languages for multilingual learning and for example, we might put in uh, English text or Chinese text and try to predict um, you know, sentiment over the two. And then we also have an English versus Chinese classifier uh, that attempts to uh, that attempts to decide whether it's an English sentence or a Chinese sentence. And by doing so, this ensures that we put the two. Uh, uh, the features from the two languages in the same space. However, there's also an issue with this. If we're just talking about sentence representations, like a single vector for a single sentence, maybe this is okay. But what if Chinese sentences on average are two thirds of the length of English sentences? And then we want to, uh, you know, learn an attentional model or something like this. There, even just by looking at the distribution over how long the sentence is, you would be able to distinguish which is which. You wouldn't be able to match those two distributions. So this becomes a lot less trivial if we want to talk about like uh, BERT representations or something like that, where the length distribution could be different. Between the two. Also, the ordering of the words between Chinese and English is completely different. So in order to match the two distributions, even if we didn't consider the length, uh, we'd have to reorder the representations in the same order. That's like, it seems like it's taking a sledgehammer to try to solve a problem that is uh, not very, um, <laughs> taking a sledgehammer to try to solve a problem of, uh, that might be solved in easier ways. So this isn't terribly conducive to like learning um, contextualized word representations, for example. Yeah. Um, I, I missed the very first part of the question. What was yeah, exactly. So you should consider very carefully which features should be the same. And I think expecting all the entire sequence of contextualized word representations to be the same is kind of a, an unreasonable ask unless that they're very, very similar languages. Um, there's a question about uh, what would be the motivation to learn uh, language invariant representations? Um, the motivation is basically it allows you to transfer across languages more easily. So if you learn um, basically invariant representations across the languages, um, then the classifier should transfer better between English and Chinese. So you should be able to share 
um, share more information from your labeled training group. Um, yeah, and this has also been done for other tasks like machine translation, but as I mentioned, it's a little bit less natural. So another thing is adversarial multitask learning. Um, the basic idea is we want some features for tasks to be in a shared space across tasks and others separate. So basically they come up with an adversarial shared private model where you share some of the features and apply an adversarial loss to the shared features. Um, but then you have uh, separate private features that vary test by test. Um, and you can uh, view the, um, the full adversarial training as basically this model or this method where all of the features are shared. And so like, this is kind of a generalization of full adversarial training. The nice thing about this is this solves this problem, right? You could still use the shared features to, um, to capture any task specific stuff, but you could force most of the features to be the same. Yeah. How do you decide which feature should be shared? So in, at least in this work, I think this was, if I remember correctly, this was based on randomly initialized networks. So it doesn't really matter which ones you choose to be shared. You just say this segment is shared, this segment is private and the model will learn appropriately. Um, yeah. Um, so which, um, which features do you make independent? Um, if you do it right at the very beginning, that's gonna be less helpful, I think, because basically you, you want the model to be able to abstract away anything that makes the domains different. So like in the extreme case, like let's say you did it at the word embeddings, um, if you did it immediately at the word embedding layer for English and Chinese, that would mean that English and Chinese word embeddings would have to look the same. Um, and that might be reasonable in some cases, like for content words, but it's not reasonable for function words because the grammar of English and Chinese is different, right? So I, I think having it relatively late in the network seems to be like the appropriate place. And that's indeed what most people do um, because then the, the network has had the time to uh, you know filter out the um, filter out the information, learn what information needs to be filtered out and filter it out before passing on the abstract features. Yeah, very good questions. Okay, um, another thing is uh, professor forcing. So this is halfway in between a discriminator and discrete outputs and feature learning. And basically the idea is you generate an output sequence according to the model, but train the discriminator on hidden states. So um, you basically have a sampled or true output sequence and you train an adversary on here. And that's actually pretty similar to what I was talking about with uh, doing discrimination over the, um, over the probabilities predicted by the model. It's just a little bit earlier than that. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about unsupervised distribution matching. And in particular, unsupervised distribution matching over, um, over actual textual inputs and features. And so unsupervised style transfer is, um, I, I talked about it a little bit before, it's where you transfer, uh, try to take text and turn it into another style, like making informal text more formal. Um, there's a bunch of other ones as well, like decipherment. So this is translating uh, ciphered sentences to natural sentences. So if you have an old cipher, like the Zodiac cipher or something like this and want to uh, decode it, or suddenly you're in the midst of a, uh, of a war before uh, they invented private key encryption, um, <laughs> this might be useful. It's, uh, it's not actually a very useful task nowadays, but you know, it's of some historical interest because there's uh, unciphered, uh, there's still ciphered text that hasn't been deciphered yet. Um, 
Another thing, this isn't really style transfer, um, but it's uh, transferring sentences with positive sentiment to negative sentiment. Um, the reason why I say it's not style transfer is because in order to do this, you also have to change the content of the text and content and style are actually different things. Um, uh, so I, I think formality transfer is the best, um, uh, is the best uh, one uh, example of this. And basically what you do is you have a, um, you have a generator that will generate, um, generate text in one style. And then you have a discriminator that tries to decide which, um, decide which style it is. And then based on the generated text, once again, you try to reconstruct the text. So this is called the cycle consistency loss. And the cycle consistency loss um, basically ensures that you can't get too far away from your original input. So in order to reconstruct the original input, you want to make kind of make minimal changes to the original uh, input. So it's basically like, You have the generator. This should be on the, maybe should be on the slide here. But you have the generator generate an input, and then you calculate the probability of the original input given the generator. And this is this becomes one of your losses. So that's a cycle cycle consistency loss. Um, so this is used really widely in un. Uh, style transfer, unsupervised mm -hmm. machine translation, other things like this. Um, the reason why you need a discriminator here is because there's a degenerate solution where you just generate the same input. So you, you set X prime to be equal to X, but that's not very useful because if you generate informal text from informal text, you're not doing style transfer at all. You're just doing copying. So um, that's the basic idea. Another example where adversarial losses have been very uh, successful is in uh, alignment of cross-lingual word embeddings. So the idea is you basically start out with uh, two completely disjoint embedding spaces. So you have like word embeddings from English, you have word embeddings from Spanish, and then you, um, you try to transform the word embeddings in English to look maximally similar to the word embeddings in Spanish. So that's A here. And then um, you map between the spaces and then you use an adversarial loss to try to align the two spaces. So you basically try to find the transform that makes embedding space uh, in English look the most like the embedding space in Spanish. And it's very, very surprising that this works at all. Uh, in an unsupervised fashion, because basically all you're um, all you're saying is that um, I want to do some transform that you know like makes this distribution look a little bit more like this one without any explicit supervision that cat translates to gato, for example. Um, but the reason why this works is because frequent words in one language tend to be similar to frequent words in another language. And um, because of this, it, it can at least do this, you know, frequency-based distribution matching, um, also distribution matching based on the density of the different parts of the space and stuff like that. So um, uh, I would have never thought this would work a priori, but now it's kind of like an accepted fact that this is possible. If you take it a step further, you can do um, unsupervised machine translation which is where you use the cycle of consistency loss. Um, and the way it works is essentially you can start out with unsupervised word embeddings like this, replace a, uh, replace a bunch of words in the, um, in the input using these word embeddings. So basically you replace each word in English and turn it into like a pseudo Spanish sentence. Um, and then uh, you, train, um, you train a model to translate from pseudo Spanish to English and pseudo English to Spanish. 
And then um, you do kind of the style transfer uh, type thing, like what I talked about before, where you have a cycle consistency loss and a discriminative loss and uh, in train the model. So basically you, you sample a whole bunch of sentences uh, from the generator like this and, um, and train the generator to, uh, to maximize the cycle consistency loss and adversarial loss. Okay. Um, so I have a question on Zoom. So you would need a word dictionary between the two languages in this case. Uh, does this approach work for languages not having a one-to-one -one word correspondence? Um, so that's a very good question. The word, yes, you do use a word dictionary and that word dictionary is not given to you a priori. You induce it in an unsupervised fashion using just basically the, the um, word embeddings which are derived from monolingual corpora in the language. However, if there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, um, then yeah, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't work as well. It doesn't work, especially for languages that are very morphologically rich. In fact, unsupervised machine translation um, doesn't work in most situations where you would like it to work. So for example, another reason why it might not work is because um, the underlying text in one language is very different uh, the content of the text in one language is very different than the context of a text in another language. So to give an example, let's say you wanted to do uh, machine translation between English and Japanese, and you used English news um, and Japanese news. So the New York Times talks about very different things than the like Asahi Shinbun or whatever Japanese newspaper does. So um, because of this, your word dictionary gets messed up at the beginning because the frequencies of Tokyo and New York align. So you start translating Tokyo into New York, and um, and then you know everything goes down from there basically. So um, unsupervised translation is very interesting, and it has been used for things like style transfer, uh, unsupervised style transfer. But in itself, it it uh, it's probably too brittle to be put into production in these cases. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are there anthropological uses like how concepts map between languages? This is a really interesting question that I, uh, I want to do research on. Um, I would definitely, I won't say definitely, but I would probably not use unsupervised translation for that because as I said, it's brittle and it would have trouble mapping the concepts. I would rather try to do something semi-supervised. So you, you start out with what aligned data you do have and then go from there to try to find alignments between like data that you don't have. Um, but yeah, there's, as far as I know, um, there's not this kind of research and it's something very interesting that I'm actually thinking about a little bit myself now. So. Um, cool. So before we went, run out of time, I want to talk about adversarial robustness in the end. So this is another um, really important uh, use case for adversarial uh, methods. And um, one of the big problems is that neural models and especially neural generation models are in general, not super robust to any sort of noise or perturbation in your data. So um, this is the famous, uh, the like famous paper that kicked this off. It's actually by uh, Belen Belenkov and Bisk, so Yannick and Bisk here. Um, and basically, what they did was they uh, they took inputs, and there's a famous. Um, uh, there's a famous uh, pseudo study from Cambridge University, which is not actually from Cambridge University, uh, where they flipped the internal characters of words and showed it to human uh, human readers, and human readers are able to understand it pretty well. Um, but machines are really poor at translating uh, or processing in general anything where the, you know there's any kind of perturbation to the input, despite the fact that humans are pretty. Uh, pretty robust to it. And so they tried this on a whole bunch of uh, different, um, uh, a whole bunch of different 
uh, inputs and translated them. And basically, uh, they saw very quickly as you changed a certain number of tokens, your uh, translation scores went down quite, quite badly. And this was true even for character-based models, not just uh, word-based models. So this was just an example of random noise, but um, adversarial noise or adversarial attacks are attacks are noise that's specifically designed to break systems. And it's relatively simple and popular in image classification systems. And basically what you do is you get um, the loss value um, of the, uh, you get the loss value of a prediction and the loss value of, normally you get the loss value of the prediction, you backprop into the parameters of the model and you optimize the parameters of the model to reduce loss. But in the case of adversarial attacks, you get the loss value of the prediction and you backprop into the actual input itself to maximize loss. So you make a change to the input um, to maximize loss. Um, so this is very simple in images because you can backprop all the way into the image. It's more difficult for text, but the input is discrete uh, because the input is discrete. So you can't just like backprop and make a small change to the representations. So what you need to do instead is you need to find some way to make a change to the actual surface form of the text that, um, that changes the output significantly. So basically, um, this is an example from a translation task where um, they just flip uh, a few characters in this, um, a few characters in this input here. And suddenly Augustine is translated into Rutgers. Um, or uh, you add a, uh, you change C into six and uh, it turns into psychopath or something like this. So, um, so basically uh, this is an example. And then the question becomes, how do they find, how do they find the token or the characters to be modifying? And basically what they do is they backprop into each of the words. They find the word that has the highest um, gradient norm with the loss function. So the highest gradient norm with the loss function means this is the word that if you changed it the most, you would, um, you would be able to uh, change the loss function the most. And then they go in and change that one by just heuristically like changing the characters or other things like that. So um, actually I should have an example on my slide of the case of images. Um, so another, another nice thing about adversarial um, uh, learning is that if you add adversarial to the beginning of anything, um, it sounds kind of funny. Uh, so if I search for uh, adversarial panda, for example, Uh, this is the most uh, this is the most famous example, and um, basically this is uh, an image where panda was uh, classified as a panda with fifty seven percent confidence. Um, but if you add a small amount of white noise to it, so this is like this is the noise that you added, but you multiply it by zero point zero zero seven, so it's basically imperceptible to the human eye. Um, this gets classified as a gibbon with ninety nine point three percent confidence. Um, and, uh, so that's, um, that's relatively obvious for, um, it's relatively obvious in images that you can make a small change to the pixel values without like humans even noticing, right? But for text, you know, you change one character, um, and you could get a completely different word that means a completely different thing. So, um, this is uh, one of my papers uh, done with uh, Paul Michel, uh, one of the, my former PhD students. And we discussed what an adversarial example means in the domain of text. And basically our definition is that it should be meaning preserving on the source side. So in other words, it, it keeps the semantics of the source sentence, um, but meaning destroying on the target side. So for a classification task, that means that it will change the label 
for a generation task, that means it will change the semantics of the target sentence. Um, so basically, uh, we have source meaning destruction, which is um, uh, one minus the semantic similarity of the source and the adversarial source. And then target meaning destruction is, um, is calculated over the reference, uh, the output of the non-adversarial input and the output of the adversarial input. And um, so then basically we say the source, the target meaning destruction is if the target semantic similarity is greater than the target semantic similarity of the adversarial input is greater than the target semantic similarity of the non-adversarial input, then we set it to zero. Otherwise, we set it as how much, like the ratio of how much the semantic similarity between the two decreased after doing the adversarial input. So note that I haven't defined semantic similarity here. And the reason why I haven't defined semantic similarity here is because defining semantic similarity is hard, right? And it's like an active research area that a lot of people are trying to work on through, you know, sentence birth or whatever, um, blue earth or whatever other uh, metric people are coming up with. So we intentionally left this under specified, um, but uh, basically the idea being that when you do an adversarial attack, you can use the most recent nice semantic similarity models that allow you to uh, measure this objective. And finally, I'd like to talk about adversarial training. Um, so we would like to train our models to be robust to small perturbations. And there's a couple of reasons why you would want to do this. Uh, one reason is maybe you're training a machine translation model on news text, but you're gonna deploy it in Google Translate or something like this, where you know your, uh, the people generating your inputs are gonna make typos or they're going to be second language learners or something else like this. So um, your input data might be more, you know, might be less robust. Or you might want to train a text classifier to classify spam when spammers go in and try to fool the text classifier by replacing all of your uh, roaming characters with Cyrillic characters or something like this. So, um, so basically, uh, there's a number of reasons uh, why you'd want to do this. So the simplest idea is you sample adversarial examples at training time and make sure that they're also classified correctly. And um, actually, you can demonstrate that this is theoretically the best possible training method that you could use for robust uh, for robustness in training under some assumptions. So uh, despite the fact that this is simple, it's, um, it's a reasonable idea. Um, there's lots of theory about this, but little for NLP tasks. And I would highly recommend this tutorial, um, the Adversarial ML Tutorial. It's by Zico Coulter in, um, in CSD here. Uh, but it's, uh, it's both very easy to follow and uh, somewhat amusing. Uh, so uh, you can take a look. Cool. Um, so that's all I have for today. Hopefully, this is a, a good uh, toolkit for what you would uh, think you'd like to do. Um, I, I see a question on Zoom, which is the gradient-based adversarial perturbations are not very representative of real data noise that's commonly seen in text. Um, are adversarial methods known to make models robust to linguistic variations seen in real world situations? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I think the answer is probably that they would not necessarily make them uh, they would not necessarily make them as robust to things that you would see in non-adversarial situations. In order to do that, you would want to have a model of the noise that you see in real situations and generate from that model. Um, I think this is more likely to be useful in an actual adversarial situation, but even adversarial training here kind of gives you a lower bound on how bad you think it would be in with other varieties of noise, I guess. So um, lower bound on how good it would be uh, when you see other varieties of noise. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, if not, uh, oh, sorry, I see one. 
Um, I mentioned content transfer when talking about sentiment transfer for text. Uh, how different is it from style transfer and how do we go about it? So that's a really good question. So um, content and style are two orthogonal things in language. So basically content is what you say and style is how you say it. Um, the major, there might not be a major difference from a machine learning perspective, or it might not be, might not be a huge difference from a machine learning perspective. The bigger difference is from the evaluation perspective. So how do you tell, how do you tell, if you allow for changes in content, how do you tell if a style transfer result is correct or not? Because you could arbitrarily change the content and turn it into something exactly like completely different. Um, and because of that, you, like how do you, like what is your criterion for uh, like preserving the, the original input? So, um, I, yeah, I, I think it's basically more like how do you evaluate and how do you model? Okay, um, great. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. This is the last lecture. So um, I'm, uh, thank you for joining the class and looking forward to your posters uh, coming up. So yeah, thanks. Bye. <laughs>